Thanks a lot, and thanks to all of you for being here. Despite despite this is uh, this is the last talk of uh, of the conference. Um, so as you as you see uh, from my title, uh, we don't really I don't really have. I'm a bit off topic, so there will be no conformative theory. Uh, and uh, and the topic of my talk actually goes more in the direction of chaos. Uh, and indeed concerns a uh, uh, set of quantum bounds that have been discussed recently uh, on, uh, on Lyapunov exponents and on transport coefficients. And, and uh, our recent work, which aims at understanding their physical meaning from, uh, from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So I'm going to talk about uh, some work that we have been doing and that we're also doing done in Paris with uh, Laura Foini and Jorge Curchan. So the, the main bulk of this talk is in this in this paper, but I'm also going to discuss some ongoing work. Okay, so so uh, let's start. Uh, I, and as I told you, really uh, somehow uh, the main bulk, the the, the aim and the, the open question that uh, that uh, uh, we wanted to address is uh, is what I'm referring here with the generic word of quantum bounds. So in particular, uh, what I have in mind um, is uh, is a uh, Mm, two different kind of bounds. So one on the quantum Lyapunov exponent and another conjecture bound, uh, which concerns the relaxation time scales. Uh, and uh, as you see, it's a bit more, more generic. So um, these two sets of bound have been discussed uh, in, in the high energy, um, I mean, started being discussed uh, in the high energy setting. And uh, what uh, I would try to convince is that the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is quite a fundamental principle of statistical mechanics, allows to give uh, somehow a derivation of the bound to chaos and also uh, it brings us uh, to to say something about this other this other bound. I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about now. So in, in this talk uh, in particular, I'm first uh, going to introduce you a bit better these bounds. Then I'm going to go back on the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Then I will tell you how what are our, our results and how can we prove uh, the bound on the Lyapunov exponent and what are our results. So let's start on the bound on the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, and uh, and to, to tell you what's the quantum Lyapunov exponent, let me give you a little introduction on the classical Lyapunov exponent. Um, so classically chaos, with the, with the words of uh, Ruel, uh, can be defined uh, uh, by looking at how small uncertainty in initial conditions grow uh, in time. And indeed, the system is chaotic if, given a trajectory in a small displacement, the distance between these two trajectories grow exponentially fast with a rate which is defined as the Lyapunov or Lyapunov exponent of the theory. Uh, so um, in a loose way, the way to account for it is to take the derivative of the trajectory to respect to the initial condition, with, which in an Hamiltonian system is nothing but the Poisson brackets between the trajectory at time t and the initial momentum uh, at time zero, and this object will grow exponentially fast in time. Now, understanding how to generalize the concept of the Lyapunov exponent in the quantum uh, domain has been the focus of a great attention since the inception of quantum mechanics. So what I would like uh, to consider today and, and to use uh, uh, today is the quantum Lyapunov exponent generalized by the square commutator. And the attention on this object uh, uh, has come only, only relatively recently. So uh, the, the object that we are interested in is this square commutator, which is really just the expectation value of a square, modulus square of a commutator between two operators at different times. So why this is the right object to look at? Because if uh, I take, instead of the generic operator A, I take X, and instead of the generic B, I take P, and I take the classical limit, this object should give me uh, directly the Poisson brackets here. So in the case of an underlying chaotic classical limit, this object should grow exponentially fast in time. So this is the kind of behavior that you would expect for, for, for the square commutator is that in the classical limit, it grows exponentially fast. And this typically holds before a time scale, which in gerbon is called the Adamfest time scale, or, or some people call it the scrambling time scale, which is proportional to the logarithm of the inverse of the Planck constant. So this is a, in the classical limit, it's long, it diverges, but it diverges quite slowly, so just as the log. Now, this quantity was introduced uh, uh, back in 1969 by Latkin of Chimikov, 
who wanted to study really the classical limit of a superconducting system. Um, but uh, somehow the attention on it, and, and probably many of you uh, would have heard about this object um, because of recent interest. And you might have heard about it because as, as such an object, when you, when you write it down, when you expand it, contains special kind of correlators, so which are out of time ordered in the sense that they have this unusual ordering in time. So there is B, a of t at time t, then there is b and a of t. So there is an unusual time ordering that uh, makes uh, these uh, this kind of correlators uh, somehow uh, mm, not accessible with the standard techniques that we usually have. Um, uh, that we usually have. So there has been a lot of attention on these uh, out of time order correlators, this OTLC. So this behavior on the right. Uh is what you expect to get the classical limit. Yes, so in the classical limit, if I have the classical limit, this will grow exponentially fast. If I have an underlying classical chaotic system. But now, because I'm, I, have a, I have a quantum- the, the part of the curve on the, on the, the, the origin of the axis. No, I mean, at, at extremely short times, so this object doesn't grow directly exponentially. So at, at immediately, there is always a, a very small time scale um that uh, that it's a microscopic time scale where this thing does something else <laughs> and then and then there is this exponential growth now what's important is this that is a relation or it's some assumption on the basis that we should reproduce the, the classical thing but also the classical thing doesn't grow exponentially at short times now this is the generic expectation i mean also so wait, wait. yes Okay. If you have an underlying chaotic system, the, the exponential growth is expected only at large times. Actually, to be more precise, there is an infinite time limit. So to take the, the quantum version, you expect the such a Yes, quantum. it's never exactly at early times because the, the uh, close to. Yes, but this is just a picture. I mean, but what's really important is that uh, in, in quantum systems, at long times, so this object is bounded by the norm of the operators. So in quantum systems, this will always saturate. So in order to see and appreciate such exponential growth, you really need a separation of time scales in order to, to, to see this, uh, this exponential. And I, I, I'm going to say a small few words about it later. And um, okay, so so the, the reason why somehow we went back to this paper of Latkin of Chinnikov is that because as usual, Kitayev somehow opened a new path in physics and he proposed to use OTOC and the square commutator as a, as a characterization of chaos also in the many body, in the many body setting. Uh, in particular, he was interested in, in the SYK um, that uh, we, we heard a talk about it yesterday. Okay, so let me just uh, give you uh, a small uh, glimpse of the fact that uh, the, the study of this OTOC in general opened uh, uh, an interest uh, also uh, in what now is referred as scrambling of operators. So, so add attention onto the dynamics of, uh, uh, of uh, operator, uh, the operator support. So in general, this square commutator uh, takes into account how uh, the non commutativity between two operators uh, given by the dynamics. So imagine you have two operators A and B, which uh, at the beginning commute. Then, uh, when you uh, take uh, time evolution, in general, the support of the operator will grow in time, and, uh, 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 and this will make the two operators non commute. So the growth of this object is expected uh, always, not only, not only for chaotic system. The fact that, uh, that uh, operators do not commute. Uh, uh, it's a generic fact, and indeed is expected and found for, for different kind of dynamics. What I'm going to be interested in today, it's really this exponential growth. And let me now go back to this comment that I was just making now, is that you expect an exponential growth only in the presence of a very large separation of time scales. So you really need a small uh, plan constant uh, or a small effective plan, plan constant. So this is usually appreciated only, only when you have uh, a classical limit, so a small h bar, or in these uh, large n models so where you have all to all interactions and you have an effective plan constant, which is one over n. So, even more, if, if you want to think about a spin chain uh, with uh, h bar equal one, you will never see such a, such exponential regime. So, th this was also proven uh, by, by Thomas Presen and collaborators. 
So you have to have in mind some sort of, of semi-classical limit where this square commutator will grow exponentially fast. So given somehow this, this intrinsic classical nature of this object, somehow uh, it, can, uh, it came or it can seem surprising that actually quantum effects bound the, the value that this quantum Lyapunov exponent can attain uh, in time. And this is the famous result of Mandazana, Shankar, and Stanford uh, in 2016. This is from ADS-CFT? The, 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 uh, uh, I mean, they, they were interested on, on the topic from the ADS-CFT bound, and uh, in, in the case of the SYK, it's saturated, but uh, the, the proof for this is not uh, it's general. Okay, it's not it's yeah. not specific. To it's not specific. Idea. So so let me tell you a few words on this because uh, I, I will go back on that. So actually, what they do so they give strong arguments and they were based so their intuition was coming from the SCFT, but actually what they do they take this uh, this correlator f of t which is a thermally regulated dot mm -hmm. uh, in which basically you have to take the density matrix the thermal density matrix you split it in four and then you sprinkle it around operators at different times. So this has Quite an unusual, quite an unusual um, um, expression. I mean, from from the low energy perspective. And, and so this is the object they were considering. And then assuming that this object had an exponential behavior, exactly in, in the same assumption that I said before, I assume that there is a regime in which this object grows exponentially. Then using analytic properties of this function in the complex plane, they they were able to derive this bound. So the, the proof is it's, it's based on mathematical properties of this correlator. And it's not particularly difficult. I mean, when you read it, you follow each step is that at the end, at the end of it, it's not really clear what's the physical principle uh, underlying this bound, which makes it also difficult to, to realize why this bound is saturated by models of black holes. So why should we expect that? Okay, let me mention that there have been other approaches uh, aiming at understanding this bound from, uh, from uh, uh, for instance, the eigenstate thermodynamic <laughs> hypothesis and other and other things. Okay, so what uh, appears in this bound? So this is a bound on a time scale because the Lyapunov is the inverse of a time scale, and it appears uh, temperature over h bar. Now this kind of time scale has been called and has been referred to as a Planckian time because it only depends on energy density and h bar, and actually. And um, somehow the attention on this, on this uh, Planckian time scale uh, came from the discussion of, of a different kind of bound, this conjectured Planckian bound. So um, discussions about, about this time scale came uh, from the realization that many different kinds of materials, ranging from copper to strange metals, as we heard yesterday, uh, are characterized by a resistivity which is linearly in time. And this characterizes materials which are very, very different energy scales. However, independently of that, they're all characterized by a time scale which is proportional to T over H bar, this Planckian time scale, which has been called by Zanin, if I'm not wrong, in 2004, this Planckian, he, he gave it this name. And also in this Danin paper, somehow uh, the, the discussion of, of, uh, of, of this time scale drew on an implicit connection with another bound, which uh, has actually been uh, proved uh, um, in uh, with on relativistic plasmas. So maybe this is what you had in mind. So it's a bound on the shear viscosity over over the, the entropy um, or the entropy density, uh, which says that this is bigger than h bar over four pi. So there is a four pi missing. Okay. So th this was coming from uh, from discussions in relativistic plasmas, and the the, the fact that uh, that the different kind of uh, of uh, transport behavior were observed that somehow brought uh, uh, some people to say that this behavior was consistent some sort of meta bound uh, which uh, which uh, uh, was constraining smallest physical time scales and it's this Planckian bound that says that the inverse of the characteristic time scale should be smaller than a constant of order one and then t over h bar. So as you see, I mean, also here I'm saying I'm putting everything in. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, it's it, here there is not a really a constant fix. So the status of this bound, as far as I'm, I, I understand, uh, is not uh, um, it's not put on solid ground. So, so not everyone believes in the existence of this second kind of uh, 
of Planck and Baud. Um, but the, the, there have been uh, progresses uh, on it, and, uh, and uh, there is this recent review that also was cited yesterday by Hartmann and McKenzie that study and, and characterize it, um, discuss the different uh, mechanisms that could lead or not to such kind of bound. So, but then if, if this bound is true, the, there is no uh, zero temperature, there is no quantum cups. So, so the, the important thing, this bound is active when you look at temperature, which are of the order of H bar. So everything, everything is valid at very low temperatures. At the, if, you, if you take the zero temperature with, with H bar finite, yes, it's a, it's a trivial, it's a trivial uh, bound. I mean, to, to have it, to, yes, exactly. To, to, to have the bounds acting non trivially, you have to look at temperatures of the order of H bar. I mean, they're, they're relevant at that order. Otherwise, yes, it's uh, there is no bound. But also here, I mean, this has not to do with the bound you wrote in the first uh, in the first time. There was no temperature of the bound. No, no, yes, and there is always there is this Planckian time scale T over H bar. The transparency there was no. There was no. There was a mistake then. Okay, so so uh, in the community there has been a lot of attention and discussion of this di different kind of bounds. So part of the attention is because uh, black hole models and, and the SCFT models seems to saturate uh, all of them. So this has been a trigger for a lot of work in high energy. As we heard yesterday, this Planck and time scale are very relevant for understanding transport and uh, strongly correlated strange metals uh, materials. Uh, and also somehow this has motivated a lot of attention in quantum information theory for understanding what are the bounds that quantum mechanics causes or information propagation. So uh, what I would like to tell you today is how, um, how uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem enters in the game, somehow it provides a natural Planckian scale coming from the Matsubara frequencies. Uh, which uh, and this, uh, this time scale, I'm going to tell you how it arises. It's given by pi. So there is this proportionality constant pi t over h bar. So this is what uh, uh, the, the aim of the talk is uh, to show how somehow this mechanism provides a natural Planckian time scale. Okay, so let's go back to the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And since uh, uh, we have talked a, a lot about conformal field theory, let, let me go back a bit to statistical mechanics. So the fluctuation dissipation theorem is somehow one of the cornerstone of statistical mechanics, uh, which gives us a relation between, between the linear response and intrinsic fluctuations. So imagine to have, uh, let, let me start from the classical case again. Uh, so imagine uh, you have a system which is a thermal equilibrium, and then you do a small perturbation uh, of intensity nu, uh, and then there is an operator B. Uh, then the response, uh, if, uh, if mu is very small, so if you're doing linear response, um, if you're doing yes, a small perturbation, the response is proportional to the internal, the, the variation of the internal fluctuations of the system with a proportionality factor, which is the inverse of temperature. Now, this fact, uh, it's not just a, a mathematical relation, but it's a very deep, uh, it's a very deep principle that, that dates back to Einstein's work on, uh, on the Brownian motion. So this is, in the classical case, uh, is, uh, is uh, very well established. And also in the quantum case, uh, it's a quite uh, a textbook uh, uh, subject of many body physics. And so uh, to, to describe it, let me just uh, um, uh, introduce a bit better what are the quantities. Here, things do not commute. So we have to define some correlation function A of T B. Since uh, things do not commute, I'm going to have a real and an imaginary part. So the real part is the symmetrized part, and we'll call it C, and it's related to the fluctuations. And then the imaginary part is related to linear response through the Kubo formula. So this is the imaginary part. We have uh, it's uh, 2i theta of t, so there is a causality, and then the imaginary part of response function, of correlation functions. And, and these are the two that usually are related uh, in the standard textbooks uh, of, uh, of many body physics. And what uh, um, I would like to pose the attention today is also an intermediate function here, f, um, where I'm taking the thermal uh, density matrix and I'm splitting it in two in this way. This is related to Weitman inner product. Uh, as far as I understand. So, and uh, what I would like to convince is that it's very useful to, to, to keep in mind this intermediate function that allow us to, to pass uh, uh, between, between these two functions. 
So the fluctuation dissipation theorem, as we said, it's usually stated in frequency as a proportionality between the imaginary part of the response function and fluctuations via an hyperbolic tangent. So that is typically we derive it as hyperbolic tangent of beta h bar omega over two. But actually, if you remember the derivations, when we actually prove uh, these, uh, these uh, relations, actually what we show is that the fluctuations are proportional to the hyperbolic cosine of beta h bar over two, and then the smooth function, this, this, the Fourier transform of the F, and then the imaginary part is again the, the hyperbolic sine, and then the smooth function. This trivially gives back what uh, what we usually derive in textbooks. So this this has to be interpreted as as the function that allows us to to write it in the usual way. And uh, for the experts uh, of you in, in the audience, uh, this uh, has a very uh, immediate interpretation in terms of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, in which we, uh, it, it's just the modulus square of the smooth function that describes off diagonal matrix elements. If you don't know what it is, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, so let's uh, just to be, just to be consistent, let's do the, um, <laughs> classical limit, but first let me tell you where this Matsubara frequency arises. They arise at the zeros of the hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine, the even and odd zeros of these two functions. So, so the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is coming with this Planckian time scale in the Matsubara frequencies. And now just an exercise, let's do the classical limit to see that we retrieve what we had before. So if now I take dh back to zero, um, which uh, it's somehow a uh, high temperatures uh, or, or very small h bar, then I have that uh, that uh, the, the c is equal to the f, so this intermediate function doesn't exist in the classical limit, and then the response is is really just the derivative of the c, which is what we discussed before. Okay, in particular, so this is uh, this is the standard FDT, but uh, we want to use a time dependent version because we want to bound the time scales. So what we can do is that we can re-express it in the time domain. And the first thing that one can write is somehow uh, an FDT in a differential in a differential form. So given the F, what is the value of the of the C and what is the value of the response? So it's quite uh, simple to realize that, that the correlation function is this differential operator, which is the cosine of beta h bar over two and then the derivative applied to f. And then, and then the, the, the response is the same thing with a sine of the derivative. So let's uh, just, just do a very a trivial exercise. So if I have a, a, an f which has an exponential dependence, then this cosine of the derivative just becomes diagonal. So it just will acquire a cosine of beta h bar a over two and then the function f. So, so this is the differential, the differential at the t, but we can also write, invert it, and given a c, so given fluctuations, but what's the value of, of this intermediate function? And this is somehow a nice interpretation. So to derive it, I just do the convolution. So they are related in their diagonal in the Fourier space. So I just do a convolution. And it's easy to, to, to see that, uh, that uh, f is given by the convolution of the correlation and this function that I'm calling, calling a blurring function that has the following shape. So it's, uh, it's one over hyperbolic cosine of this, uh, of this Matsubara frequency has this bell shape, um, uh, this uh, shape of a, of a bell. It has a height, which is the Matsubara frequency and a width, which is its inverse. So if I take uh, the, the naive classical limit, h bar going to zero, or which is omega going to infinity, this blurring function becomes a delta, a delta function. So the fact of having a beta h bar finite, it's really somehow to, to do the convolution with, with this blurring function, which is smoothing out, which is blurring the steepest details of correlation functions from the fluctuations going into F. Okay, so the fact of this hyperbolic cosine and sine appears as a blurring in the time domain. This is the interpretation of this hyperbolic cosine. And this is what we will use now. So of course, you can write relations also going from R and, and these have been, have been um, used also in the past. And so, so there, is a, there is a complete way to treat this fluctuation dissipation theorem in the time domain. So now what I would like to do is to use what I just described you to provide a very uh, intuitive proof of the bound to chaos of Maldasana, Shankar and Stanford, and then to tell you what we have been doing and uh, how progress on understanding the Planckian bound. So let's go to the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, you might be wondering 
uh, why the fluctuation dissipation theorem has something to say about chaos, because I just told you that these are uh, chaos, it's usually quantified from OTOC that are four point function with uh, an unusual time ordering. What uh, we can show, and it's quite a simple derivation, is that actually OTOC can be seen as two times correlation function in a replicated space. So the idea, uh, it's quite simple. You, you introduce the spectral representation and then, and then you replicate the space. So you just make a copy. This is quite standard. Now I have some set operators A and B, which are just the tensor product of the operators into two different spaces and affect Hamiltonian H, which is the direct sum. So now you see that from this expression, I have rewritten it as something like IJ and JI. So it's enough to introduce a swap operator, which is basically correlating the two spaces. So it swaps states between the two spaces. And what I can do is that is I can express this form of OTOC as a, as a, a standard expectation value. So a trace um, uh, at twice the temperature. So this beta two is a beta over two of this kind of, uh, of correlation function. So of these two uh, operators, so fat A and BT. So um, to, to, to recap, we started from the, this OTOC, which here I took a different regularization from the one I showed you before. And, and I showed you that it's just a two-point function. So this OTOC that seems very uh, different is a two-point function. But of course, there is this strange operator, the swap operator, which is no local in the two spaces. And it's doing all the dirty job of, of doing this uh, out, of time, out of time correlations. Um, Okay, so you might have heard about the thermofield doubles. Uh, so, so this is exactly the, the swap plus a, a um, partial transpose that makes you um, go from, from this thermal state to the thermofield double. So for, for, for those of you that's not, so usually OTOC can be written as expectation values on pure states which are, which are entangled and are these thermofield doubles which are couple of maximally entangled states of these two copies. Here, we're doing something different. So here we are writing it as a, as a thermal expectation value. This, ther this density matrix is a thermal density matrix. But at the end, I I'm using this operator P. So everything is the same. It's just that this expression, it's quite simple from people coming from statistical mechanics because we know two-point correlation functions very well. And we know uh, everything about it. And in particular, they obey the fluctuation dissipation <laughs> theorem. So this is what I'm going to use now. So now, uh, now that I have OTOC as two-point function, I can define a fat correlation and a fat response. And of course, I can also uh, consider this intermediate function f, fat f, that it's going to be given by half um, uh, the, this, uh, the thermal density matrix as twice the temperature split in two. And if you write it back in the original space, this is exactly the, the correlation function, the regulated OTOC for which the bound was proved. So this intermediate function has this now, this quite uh, intuitive interpretation, this double space, so it's just the intermediate function between, uh, between the C and, and the R. So in particular, um, the, the, this can be seen as a set of correlation functions in, uh, of two times correlation function. In particular, they obey the fluctuation dissipation theorem at twice the temperature. So, and, and this is what I, I'm going to use now to prove uh, the bound to chaos. So uh, let me start uh, from, from this correlation function. So, so what we can do, uh, so here I'm not giving you all the formula, but just the idea. So the correlation is fat C and fat F can be written as two point functions minus the square commutator, both of them. They, they will just have a tiny different regularization, but they ha both have this structure. So they are two point function minus the square commutator. And now basically we input some physics and we say that uh, after a small time, uh, um, time scale an intermediate uh, um, time scale that usually is called dissipation time scale, the two point function become a constant and then the square commutator starts growing exponentially. And this is basically why also, also in the assumption that I wrote in the first slide, usually the, the fat F, which is the standard correlator uh, is a constant minus an exponential term. Okay, because basically they can be written as two point functions minus a square commutator. But now what's important is that this square commutator for both of them is positive definite. So the coefficient in front of the sign, in front of the, uh, in front of the exponential growth has to be positive. 
And this is what I'm calling the sign argument. So the fact that the, the, there is this positivity between the coefficients in front of the square commutator. Okay, so now that I know that, I also know because of the FGT that the two of them are related. So we already did the exercise. Now we have an F, which has a term that depends exponentially in time. And, and the, this tells me that basically the C is nothing but the cosine of beta two H bar over two lambda, and then the exponential growth of the F. But now we're saying that the coefficients in front of the exponential growth should both be positive, and which immediately gives us the bound of Maldasana, Shankar, and Stanford. So let me just, uh, recap what we're doing here, uh, we're using the fact that OTOC are correlation in a double space, which are characterized by the FDT, and we are using the FDT plus the fact that these are kind of special correlations because there is a, there is a sign argument between, uh, between the two of them to prove the bound to chaos. So the, the, the derivation is not particularly simpler or shorter than the one of Maldasen and Schenker and Stanford. It's just clear that what are the physical ingredients that we're using here, which is the, the FDT and, and, and the sign argument. And let me mention that the, the Vota paper in 2018, which in a different fashion um, did, uh, did uh, somehow very similar derivation and it's a nice paper that hasn't been appreciated much. Okay, but uh, encouraged uh, uh, by, uh, by this fact, um, we, we somehow uh, decided to use the FDT or thought about using the FDT also to show other things. So maybe before going into that, do, do you have some questions uh, about, uh, about this slide? I'm sorry, FDT was what again? Ah, it's the fluctuation dissipation yeah. theorem. Is, is this uh, the fact that basically if you have a correlation function that uh, different kind of correlation functions are all related. So this is the, the, the KMS, there is this symmetry between correlation functions that you have, if you have one of them, you can get also the response and this intermediate function. Mm -hmm. How about locality problems? So for instance, everything you have in this, uh, is local, this project is, is small operator is local. So, so the fluctuation distribution theory that doesn't care about uh, so it's, it's even more general. You can have a correlation for also that they are non-local and it doesn't need the translational environment, it just needs equilibrium. Okay, so once you have a thermal density matrix, there is this relation between the correlation functions. So somehow there is more structure, of course, that depends on the model, uh, but uh, this is, says something more about the structure of the correlation functions in frequency. This is just a, a relation between them of this bound. I mean, now for us, it's a bound that is imposed by having the quantum fluctuation dissipation theorem. So somehow the, 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 on, the, on, this, on this Lyapunov exponent. So Lyapunov exponent tells you something about the chaotic property, classically, no? about the chaotic properties uh, of the model. Then, then if you have it in quantum systems, uh, you can generalize it to this uh, OTOC. And now quantum, the quantum fluctuation dissipation theorem tells you that th th this object cannot be too large. I think it, it just means that you know, this uh, time order correlator, you have an exponential increase at intermediate times and the, 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 the scale cannot be larger than the right? Yes. Of course, in realistic systems, we don't see clearly this exponential because it eventually is saturated. So, I mean, provided that you're good enough to see an exponential, you have to satisfy this. In particular, this, this bound was saturated <laughs> by, by this, uh, this SYK model with such that Yekitaev, which was a bit the beginning of the study and why, and by black holes and what else is that? In the classical system, instead of there is no bound. No, because in the class, you send h bar, h bar to zero. And, so you really need to, 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 to take a beta h bar of the one to, to see something happening. What, what, what is the physical picture? For, for something like this to happen. So think about uh, what you can think about. You, you want to go to very low energy because you want uh, temperature to be of the order of each bar. You want to have chaos up to very low temperature. So you need a model, which is not obvious because if you take a spin chain and you go to very low, you will not see. So you, you need a model which hosts the chaos up to very, very small temperature. So like a billiard, which has chaos. So then it also, it also have, uh, so in that case, in that case, this bound will pop in and prevent the, the growth rate of this correlation to be too large. 
prevents chaos to be to, to, to develop too fast due to quantum uh, constraint. And because of the fluctuation, uh, for us, it's because of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Because these are not complete. We have, we have a picture changes from chaos classical to quantum regime that would, uh, would uh, give, me, give you some understanding <laughs> in terms of this, this thing. Is it, is it clear to, to the expert? So what, what, is, what is bounding the rate? So what's the... So why why is bar should... Uh, Counteract the classical chaos. chaos uh, so I don't think there is a general picture. There is no, no there, is, there is no simple because picture. It's a similar as a property somehow. To the, yes. The very simple. Yes. Simple picture. So we 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 worked on something trying to understand uh, uh, in, in a in a case in which you could have a classically evaluation of the bound, yes. but in the quantum case uh, you have something different. So in that case, we consider with Jorge, so actually it was before this, in that case, we consider dynamics of a particle on a curved manifold, because when you have a particle on a curved manifold with negative curvature, you can have chaos. In that case, uh, classically, it violates the bounds. There are all scalings that you can, you can find. So we, we were wondering, okay, how does the bound pop in? Uh, and in that case, we saw, um, so, but uh, to be precise, uh, the, the negative, uh, the surface of negative curvature, the, the pseudosphere, so the Poincare disk is unbounded, so you need to make it bounded. So there's a, but in that case, uh, it seemed that was the effect of curvature, because in, in, in quantum systems, basically curvature generates a potential, which depends on the curve, which depends on the sign of the Gaussian curvature. The Gaussian curvature is negative, then the curvature becomes uh, repelling. So somehow regions which are more curved are the ones that classically would give you more chaos, but in quantum system, they, they repel you. So the, the particle doesn't want to be in regions which are more curved. And so this is why, why the Lyapunov of exponent becomes saturates instead of, uh, of uh, exploding. Uh, I think it's also related to the fact uh, that uh, quantum means that it saturates while classically. No, 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 no. No, because, because uh, you, you need to take h bar very small. So basically, you want to send h bar to zero in order to have a long time scale. But you want beta h bar to be order one. So, so you're, you're still looking at very low temperature. So this is also why to, to have something where the bound uh, acts non-trivially, uh, you have to it's a bit tricky because you have to, these two different layers. So you want beta h bar to be fine, but you want to send the h bar to zero because you want the atom first time to be large. And which is the case, so in the SYK, which is uh, this model that doesn't have quasi-particles, so, so that has uh, this extensive entropy up to the lowest energies, in that case, there is clearly a chaos up to low temperature because there is this extensive entropy also at low temperature. So you can also, you, are, you can send n to infinity, which is sending your h bar to zero, but uh, at very, you, you can go to very low temperatures and you will still see chaotic behavior because the entropy is extensive. So this. So when you don't have a uh, separation of scales, and you keep your general results in your... Yes. I, uh, we have been thinking about it because, uh, yes, the, the structure is always... So uh, this is always true, and the sign argument is always true. Then what it implies on... Uh, this is something um, we, we didn't... Uh, we still didn't uh, do, but uh, it's definitely uh, worth seeing what's the fact. Yes, yes. I mean, the, yes, the, this FDT plus sign argument is still true. So it could imply something non-trivial. Uh, so, but also as far as I understand, maybe uh, there is not a clear picture on how what should be the growth of a square commutator uh, in a in a lattice model uh, in a in a standard. Uh, so there are, there are numerical evidence. There is numerical evidence in different uh, kind of uh, systems, but uh, the only rigorous results are like. For instance, the ones on random circuits, and they are at infinite temperatures, which is a different. Uh, so not not where this is relevant. So it's not very clear. I mean, what to put if you? you sh I mean, I, I we, we can discuss about. It. I thought okay, you put a power law, but then. Uh, so you're saying, in particular, the chaos bounds that you're interested in make sense at low temperature. Yes. So uh, at that, yeah, when when beta h bar is order is order one, it, it's active at low temperature. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, typically, like we would think of, you know, chaos thermalization yes. at some fixed temperature. Yeah. 
No, it's a, it's a tricky limit. I mean, to have it, to act non trivially, you need BTH bar to be over or the order one, but you also need to, to have a, a large uh, atom for uh, scrambling time, what they call it, scrambling time. So it's, um, okay, so I, I think this part, I'm going to skip it because uh, there is no time enough. I, I wanted to tell you a bit more about two point functions that maybe are more interested, uh, interesting for this audience. Okay, so just, just to flash that uh, with these results, you can do many other things. You can generalize uh, bounds. You can uh, use them to somehow suggest uh, measurement schemes of OGOC. But now what we, we, we really think it's, it's the open question is to understand this Planckian bound, which is quite mysterious. And you can also argue that uh, somehow uh, transport and two-point functions are more relevant than Ali Apunov exponent, which is not really clear what it is. And so, so we have done some, some progress uh, uh, on it, but we don't have a finite result. So also, if you want to discuss in the next week, I'm going to be here. So the idea is now to use the blurring. So the FDT from the other side, okay? This blurring of correlation functions. So, so now I, I'm taking just a standard two-point function, which decays exponentially fast at very large times. So larger than some uh, dissipation time that, that depends on the microscopic of the system. So I don't know what happens at short times, but I know that at large enough times, this decays exponentially with a rate A, which I can tune as I want is a parameter. And now if I have the C, what we discussed is that in order to have the, the, the intermediate function, I have to do the convolution, which this blurring function, which had this exponential, uh, this uh, uh, inverse of uh, uh, hyperbolic cosine. So this also decays exponentially fast with a rate, which is again, this Matsubara frequency. Okay. So now we have to evaluate uh, this, uh, this integral, this convolution. And we have that basically um, you, you can, uh, th there are two different situations. So when the rate A is smaller than omega, basically your, your correlation function is almost a constant with respect to this blurring. So um, all this convolution is going to be dominated by, uh, okay, there is not a T prime. So here, it, so in this plot, there is T prime. So, and I'm doing a convolution of uh, co this correlation with this, uh, this blurring. So, when, uh, uh, and this is time t. So when a is smaller than omega, this integral is going to be dominated by times which are of the order of t, basically because c is a constant at, respect, at large time to respect to, to, to the blurring. And so the correlation function is going to be given by the same rate, which is a, and then there is a proportionality factor, which is again, uh, what we were describing before. But then if there is some sort of transition when A, this parameter becomes larger than the Planckian scale, because indeed you can convince yourself that actually the integral is going to be dominated by very early times, because there is that you have here E to the minus A T prime and here A to the plus T prime. So the integral is going to be dominated by this part, the early times which we don't know. So it's a bit, there is this correlation between early time and large times. So here I'm writing it with a coefficient that comes from the integration of this, uh, of this uh, uh, integral. And now if I know the result for F, I can just apply the differential FDT on this side and obtain a, a, a result also for the response. So what I'm saying is basically that if my correlation function is decaying exponentially fast with a rate A due to the blurring of the FDT, the intermediate function f and the intermediate function r, they will both decay exponentially, but now with a rate which is bounded by omega. Because if c is finite, so if this coefficient is finite, then uh, when I have a sum of two exponential, the smaller rate will dominate. So the, what I'm saying basically is that if this coefficient is finite, the, bound, the, the rate of decay of f and r is bounded by the first much better frequency. And this is again, provided that this coefficient is finite. Now it seems that this result uh, um, is a bit too strong because what I'm trying to say is that basically due to the fluctuation dissipation theorem, all uh, response function have a decay rate which is bounded by the much better frequency, which is a bit too strong. And of course it can, I mean, of course, and it cannot be, but what I'm doing basically is that I'm shifting the condition on a bound on two times correlation, uh, two time correlation into a condition 
on, on the existence of these coefficients c of omega, which are in front of the exponential decay. Let, let, let me let me uh, re, re tell you, resummarize uh, something about this slide. So we wanted to say something now, not about exponential growth, but about exponential decay. We take a generic correlation that decays. We compute the convolution, which is that we, we, we use the blurring of the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And basically this blurring of the fluctuation dissipation theorem tells me that the intermediate function, and the response are bounded. So they're given by a sum of two exponential uh, and the coefficient in front of the second exponential uh, has a certain expression. And now if this coefficient is finite, it means that the response function is always bounded by the Planckian time scale. Do you, do you have questions? But what I'm doing, I mean, I'm not solving the problem. I, I'm, I'm saying that now what I have to do to have a bound, I have to, I have to understand whether this coefficient, which is written as the integral for minus of, here, of, of this function is finite. And, and this integral is defined only if, uh, if the rate of decay is bigger than omega, otherwise uh, it's not defined. So I would like to understand uh, whether this is finite or not. So what we started doing was to somehow look for simple models where we can check these things. So we started from the simplest case, which is uh, which is a, just a Lorentzian uh, uh, correlation in frequency. So we drew the model of, of diffusion. So just I have a correlation which decays uh, um, decays to to exponentially from time t equal to zero. So this is just a plot. I have a, a parameter a, and 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 I can tune it to be larger or smaller than omega. Now I ask: Is there a bound for this model? Well, I have to compute my coefficient, and my coefficient is finite. So indeed, when you when you do, it's just it's just a uh, integral in the complex plane. When you when you find it, you find that the response has the same is the same rate of decay of the correlation when a is smaller than omega. Which is the, max, the the Planckian time, and when a is larger than omega, it's bound that the decay rate of the response is the same of uh, of the max beta frequency, so it's bound. So, so in your model, what's set in capital omega? What? What is set in capital omega in your model here? I mean, capital omega is always is always the Planckian time. So I, I'm I'm taking so it's it's not a, a, it's not a simple model sorry it's a, it's a simple correlation with a bound so if i have a correlation which has the, the which is a simple exponential then the decay rate of the response is bounded due to the fluctuation dissipation theorem so i start from a correlation which has this form but 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 now there is a relation between all these correlations so it's not that the response is free to respect to the c the response is related to c by the fluctuation dissipation theorem which is which is giving me this bound and omega is always the same so it's always pi over beta h bar so you the well if it's a because in that case if the correlation you will have a uh, no you will have a, a delta function you need something that decays exponentially mm -hmm. yes yes so Yes, so you also have an exponential decay. Uh, yes. But now, okay, so let's go almost to, to the, the final thing, which is an example where actually this bound doesn't hold, um, which, is, which is the Lattinger model. So this is the closest I can to confirm my theory. And um, so, so, but I, I don't go very deep in it. So I just take this Hamiltonian. Uh, on the lattice, so, so I take the bosonic model on the lattice, and I want to do it because I want to regularize large momenta. So here I have pi over over two a. A is the lattice spacing that one would eventually like to send to zero, and I have the, the, the usual conjugate variables. So and then uh, what you can do? Well, you can compute correlation functions. The model is exactly solvable. Um, so so we we want to look at the uh, the, the fluctuations, so the real part of this correlation function. Uh, and, and you can compute it, you, you sit down, and this, uh, uh, it has some expression which is not very relevant, but at large times, so it decays exponentially in time, and everything is dominated by the Lattinger parameter, which is the one that appears in your Hamiltonian. Okay. So now the question, this is an exponential decay, and it seems that with the Lattinger parameter, I can violate the bound in omega. 
So the question is that, do I have a bound at one, one over two? Because I have to compare this with omega, so that the bound that I'm claiming is so general should, uh, should uh, uh, tell me that something is happening at one over two. And indeed, if you compute the thing and then, and then you look at it, this, uh, this coefficient uh, uh, here for n equal to zero, uh, these coefficients vanish. So for, for, for this Lattinger model, th there is no bound. I mean, let me mention that there is something strange happening at one over two. We're not really clear of what, what it is. So if you don't do this regularization, the standard result for the correlation in the continuum has this one over hyperbolic sign. So in one over two, this becomes an unintegrable divergence in t equal to zero. So you cannot take the, the, um, the t, uh, you cannot take the Fourier transform. So we thought, I mean, this is why we needed to do, to include this contribution. Anyway, this is just to say that we find a model, quite a standard model, where there is no bound. And so by thinking a little bit more, we realize that actually these coefficients that, that now um, we are discussing can be rewritten as, a, as an integral over this contour in, um, in, uh, in the complex plane on a stripe, which is, uh, which is of width beta. And now if the function f is analytic on the whole stripe, then, then this coefficient vanishes. So, so uh, this is absence of bound if, if the correlation function f is, is analytic in the whole stripe, which is what happened in, uh, in the case of the Latinger limit. On the other hand, what we know is that this function is analytic for finite t, but it could be, it could vanish. I mean, it could have poles in uh, Euclidean time, so on, the, uh, on this, uh, this time. So if uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, region, it has a non-analyticity, no, non -analyticity, then there is a bound. And these are the two cases I discussed before, the Lattinger liquid is analytic and, uh, and the, um, the, the correlation function for, for, the, um, for this uh, through the model was not. So now what we would have to do is to understand somehow we rephrase everything again in terms of analytic properties of correlations in the complex plane, which is exactly what we didn't want to do. So now we have to understand what's beyond that. So what's generic for a chaotic system to be, to be, um, and, and what, what are the ingredients that, what, what's the condition that we need on top of that? So oh, let me let me summarize uh, uh, what we discussed. I hope I convinced you that the fluctuation dissipation theorem has something to tell us about the behavior of uh, correlation functions in the time domain. It seems to be a mechanism that provides natural bounds for for the decay rate and even more maybe for for some other conditions. So we used it uh, at the beginning to understand what happens uh, about. Uh, about the OTOC and this bound to chaos, it seems that it gives a proof, so which is quite straightforward. And there are many things that we would like to understand. I didn't discuss at all this, uh, this response function, which was not introduced before. And it seems that uh, this is the right object to be measured. It has an interpretation in terms uh, of, uh, of ETH and other things. And then of course, uh, the, the really big open question is to understand this, uh, this Planckian bound, which is the bound on, on two point uh, time scale. And we have this, uh, this idea that, uh, that it's a good clue, the fluctuation dissipation theorem is a good way to go. So it, it's telling us something, but it's not the whole story. So we, we, need to understand what, we need to understand what question to ask to these correlation functions. Okay, and, and with this, I thank you. And I, I, since I'm the last one of, uh, of uh, the, the week, I would like really to thank the organizers for this uh, wonderful workshop. Uh, and I think everyone will agree with me. Okay. Uh, there were already many questions in the talks in the session. Um, are there more questions? I, I do have one general question, which is so you know bounds are one thing, but um, you know obviously like the story of how these operators spread is much more than just sort of mm -hmm. bounds. Have you thought about other things that you might learn from mm -hmm, this connection mm -hmm. with fluctuation dissipation, just about? You know, operator spreading mm -hmm, a, mm -hmm. uh, more generally. So, so this is related to both the question I think that uh, that I was asked before. So, um, on one side, this uh, the fluctuation dissipation theorem holds uh, much more than the exponential growth. Right. So, it, it's definitely a very a very good question. But somehow, uh, with respect to the operator spreading, which really assumes uh, somehow 
the communication between two operators at different sites and how this uh, grows uh, in time and in space. Here, there is the locality element missing. So here we only have time. Um, and uh, um, uh, so, so uh, it could say something about rates or velocities, but uh, one uh, uh, should think more carefully about it. And also the problem, as I was mentioning before, is that all the rigorous results uh, usually are for random uh, unitary circuits or, or this uh, floquet kind of in this setting. And they're very beautiful works, but they, they work at infinite temperature, which is not where here um, where, where this is relevant. <laughs> I think you briefly mentioned the point where it is, but I forgot what was the statement. Was it that when you have negative curvature, it bounds all the sensor ages? Or? No, so so because uh, because Andrea was asking me when uh, what what the physical what, when uh, can I make, can I see a, a physical mechanism that is implementing uh, the bound which is enforced? So so we we don't have the answer in general. What I was mentioning that what we tried to do was somehow to find the simplest model where the band was actually acting non-trivially. So what we came up with was uh, to find a, a class, to look for a classical model, which would violate the bound. And this is the chaos on the Poincare disk. Um, you might, so in that case, the, the Lyapunov exponent goes like square root of T. So this clearly at low temperature violates the bound. So if I, if I plot here, lambda T over H bar, which is the quantity that should be bounded. So th this is the bound, the two pi. So this thing do, does something like that. So this violates the bound. So in, in this setting, we wanted to see what happens uh, to the bound. So if we can <coughs> find the mechanism and in the geometry that we build, it's clear that it's the, cur the, the quantum effect of the curvature, which are implementing the bound. So, um, this, uh, this idea that the curvature generates a potential, which is repulsive. Uh, so the, the, the more curved region are the most chaotic in the classical case, but also they repel the particle from, uh, we can discuss more about it like this. It's, it's, maybe it's a bit difficult. But we were thinking of what's the mechanism uh, where the bound is acting, uh, because in, this is a bit too, uh, it's general, but at least uh, give some hints.